otherwise I'll run you over. So as soon as he gives me that thumbs up, I'm going to announce and bounce. Next up, we have How to Move Mountains by Aaron Natu. Please give him a warm Torcon welcome. Thank you. Um, so this is going to be a little difficult because I like to move around a lot, and I'm in a fixed mic, so I'll try to just keep my upper body moving. That's it, not the lower half. Uh, so this talk is called How to Move Mountains. Um, it's a pretty broad topic that I'm going to be diving into, uh, so I don't really have the chance to cover everything I want to cover. Um, so I wanted to make note of that up front so that if you have any questions, please make note of it during the presentation. Write it down. Contact information's here, whatever format works for you. Uh, and reach out to me after or talk to me at the con. I'm going to be hanging around, so I'm happy to have a conversation about this. So let's get started. Um, obligatory about me. I'm a senior security researcher at Security Compass, and uh, these are all the different things that I've done. The top three uh, pr roles in particular are very relevant to this topic that we're going to be discussing today. So let's actually get into what this talk is about. Um, this talk is about something uh, called DevOps. But in particularly, it's about how DevOps really is, or DevOps as the solution, is the problem for security and why that is. So let's first talk about DevOps as the solution. DevOps as the solution uh, is really made to help improve a number of things at business and, and to really bring uh, the business forward with through development. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean in a second. First off, it's about improving the speed of business. This is Mercury, the Roman god. Uh, he was the messenger of the gods, so we had to be fast. Funny enough, he was actually the uh, god, uh, the patron saint of financial gain and commerce. Um, so it's quite telling us to the importance of speed when it comes to uh, business. DevOps is really there to um, equip the business with ways to start developing and iterating faster and faster. And they do this through uh, a number of different ways, of which I'm going to speak about soon. First of all, it makes developers more than just developers. So in a DevOps environment, developers are tasked with much more than just simple software development. They're tasked with being QA, operations, and security. And that last point, if it doesn't terrify you, wait till we keep talking. <laughs> so they're tasked with doing more today. DevOps is also about bringing us from the old, slow method of doing waterfall all the way through to CI, CD. So CI-CD stands for continuous integration or continuous delivery. It can also mean continuous deployment, depends on what you say, but um, I like to think of continuous delivery because it's a little more realistic than continuous deployment sometimes. And agile kind of fits in the middle. The way I look at agile is it is a software development methodology that transitions us from waterfall through to CI-CD. And that's, when I say CI-CD, that's essentially like the gold standard of what we want to achieve. In reality, only a handful of companies are truly doing it. Um, but it should be something that we aspire to, and it's something that if you're adopting the DevOps uh, way of doing things is really what you are, are pushing towards. So let's take a look at traditional SDLC. This is kind of what Waterfall looks like in each, in, uh, in each iteration. So you go through the requirements um, straight through to, I can't even see my laptop here, so I'm gonna look over this way. Requirements, design, development, testing, and deployment. It's a standard, this is what we know, um, this is what we've been doing for years and years, and it works, but it's slow. And often it ends up with this. When you're trying to merge together 50 different issues, 50 different features, all in one, all on one weekend usually, um, it ends up in long weekends. Because not only is it you're trying to merge together all these different issues and hope that it works out for the best, but you're also merging in issues and features that come from, that were developed in different environments. They weren't necessarily developed in this same environment as much as as much as we like to say we equip our developers with these uniform laptops and they all have the same image off the bat, I guarantee you every single one of them has their own flavor of Vim, their own flavor of uh, you know, Ruby. Everything that they want and they use is usually customized. And so when you're bringing in those different environments, trying to put them all together in one go, it results in a long weekend and sometimes weeks of pain and suffering for developers, operations, QA, everyone involved in deploying these applications. So it's a pain, especially if you're doing six month plus release cycles. Usually those drag on and become longer as you do this more and more because you experience this pain, you don't want to experience it again, so it just takes longer. 
So let's move on to continuous delivery. This is what it looks like. I struggle to actually find a real consistent pipeline for continuous delivery, um, so I created one based on how I've seen it. So this is what it looks like. But one key thing to note here is that it doesn't, look where it starts. It starts with commit. It doesn't start with, if you look at the last slide, is this working? If you look at the last slide, it, this starts with requirements and design. Those two things are essentially negated when you get to continuous delivery. They don't go away entirely, but they become smaller and smaller, and they become um, something that the developer takes on themselves as well. There's a certain aspect of trust when you move to the uh, continuous delivery pipeline. So you notice that it starts to commit, and one other thing that I will point out about continuous delivery is that, is that it ends at measure and validate, but it's not the one that you may think. Measure and validate oftentimes doesn't necessarily mean whether it's working in production because that's tested all in all the steps before that. What it means is that you're measuring tests being done by the business. So think about canary testing, A-B testing. These are tests that are done to measure the effectiveness of features that you're putting out, of new things you're putting in the software, how it relates back to the business. So this is an important concept that really differentiates continuous delivery from waterfall because it allows the business to see direct returns quickly on something that they want developed for the business to improve. So let's move on to the next, the next thing I want to talk about, and that's DevOps as the problem. So this is, the, where the, this is where I'm going to discuss how DevOps has become a problem, especially for security. <coughs> security has always been traditionally the gatekeepers. This has been our role when it comes to software development in an organization. Where security is often full of manual processes such as pen tests, code reviews, um, even, even enforcing policy is very, very manual. And if we go back to what continuous delivery looks like, this is almost entirely automated, except for when you get the QA test. That is mostly manual, but there's still quite a bit that you can automate for that as well. So if we're going to be the gatekeepers, and we have all these manual processes, how do you think that's going to scale when we're facing off against machines that do this quickly and efficiently? It doesn't. Especially when you come to this number right here. This is the ratio of developers to operations to security in the average technology company today. And before you say we're not a technology company, so it doesn't apply to us, everybody's a technology company. Everyone's developing software, everyone's using technology. Nowadays, it's, it's not, you're not really relevant if you're not a technology company. So this applies to everyone. And if we're talking about manual processes, this is one security person holding up 100 developers as they try to release code, but they have to wait for security to review it in one day. Then the next day, the same thing happens. The next day, the same thing happens. Eventually, the buildup gets too high that it just, it doesn't work and security doesn't work. This is another problem that we have um, when we're talking about DevOps is developers, because they're tasked with being QA, being operations, being security, they're tasked with doing a lot and it gets overwhelming. So a lot of the developers that I've spoken to, the most common complaint is I'm expected to keep up with engineering best practices, with development best practices, I'm supposed to do that really well. How the hell am I supposed to keep up with the latest security threats with understanding how to write code securely. And at the speed at which security is evolving, how do I keep up? You can't, it's overwhelming, it's too much. When developers are given the responsibility of writing code securely, and they don't have a background in security, how are they supposed to keep up and get up to pace to be able to do that? It's a lot. And finally, when we're talking about all of these problems together. The way that, develop, that, that security essentially slows down developers. If we slow down the business enough, eventually we're gonna get bypassed. This is gonna happen. And it doesn't become a problem until it is a problem, at which point it's a big problem. We all know what that means. So we don't wanna be the ones to slow down the business. So now let's talk about how to actually do DevOps and security together. This is where the, the title of the talk comes in. It's uh, aptly named How to Move Mountains. It's possible, but there's a way you gotta do it, and, and many people aren't doing this right. 
So I'm going to tell you how to actually go about doing this. First off, we cannot be the gatekeepers anymore. We can't be the ones that are gating releases or slowing down developers because they're moving too fast and we're not going to be able to keep up. So to use the same metaphor, we should tear down this gate and build a road together into the beautiful sunset that is continuous delivery. I know it's corny, but that's how we take the metaphors. We take down those gates and we help work with developers alongside them and not necessarily as these gatekeepers. So let's talk about how we actually implement DevOps and security together. There's two key things that you need to know, two key ways that we can do this. First one is education. So the main idea of education is that because we are asking developers to write code securely, because we are empowering them with all these tasks and responsibilities, we need to make sure that they know what that looks like. And it doesn't have to be difficult. So I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more about, not, not about what to teach developers, not what to educate them on, because that's been covered at length in a number of different conference talks, a number of different resources on that, and it's very uh, organization dependent. Because, um, because of the nature of application security, AppSec is very dynamic. It's, it's why I love it, but it's also why it's difficult to do. Because if you look at vulnerabilities in application security, they're not really universal across all, um, all applications. Think just one class of vulnerability, business logic vulnerabilities. That's entirely dependent on the application itself. So if we're talking about how to, what to teach developers to write code securely, um, it's difficult to do that because it's, it depends. It depends on the organization, it depends on the imp implementation. So I'm going to talk about, instead of what to teach, I'm talking about how to teach it. And I will start by talking about how we've taught it in the past, and then I'm going to talk about how I've seen we can teach it in this, as we're transitioning into this DevOps model. So first off, we have the Belt program. This is something that Adobe started, and I believe Etsy's taking this on as well. So these are some pretty, pretty big orga organizations that are doing this. The way that it works is you can think about, uh, think about martial arts and how you transition from the white belt all the way up through the black belt, and then there's different ones above that as well. But the idea is that you're transitioning through a series of belts. And the way that it works is you have at the, there's, at Adobe, the way they've done it is there were the bottom two, there's four belts. The bottom two belts, the way to do that is you have to go through a, an exam. Pass an exam, you get that belt. Awesome. It's like a certification. And then developers then display that in everywhere they're communicating. They display what belt they have uh, because everyone knows what that means and it's a symbol of pride to have that, to show that you know how to develop code somewhat securely. But when you get to the last two belts, this is where the rubber really meets the road. This is where you are, um, developers have to actually apply something, write something, do something that improves the overall security of their organization. So you have to practically apply what you're learning to get those final two belts, which is not easy, but it can be done. So think about writing, um, you know, writing a webhook that connects into your Git system to do some kind of linting or parsing on code to make sure it's done more securely. That's an example of it. We're doing a certificate management program or a secret management program. Things like this where you're applying what you're learning to the organization and it helps overall to improve the security of the organization. That's how the belt program works. Next is security champions. So this is, this is a program in which you have developers or people with an IT background um, or software development background in the organization who come from these teams and then they become uh, an advocate for security or a champion for security. So by doing this, uh, they, they get taken into the fold of security, they learn what they need to learn uh, specific to the organization, and then they go back to their team and they share that and, and help enforce that. This helps scale security because rather than having the 100 to 1 ratio that we have, uh, you now have 100 to 1 plus 1 for each team, and it spreads throughout the organization because security can't always be side by side with developers, but their other developers can. So this is how Security Champions works. Um, they t typically take care of a lot of the uh, more low level security implementation things with developers. So the next way that we do uh, implement security education is through Center of, center of Excellence. Uh, this method is usually built upon Security Champions because it can help it, but it doesn't have to be. The way that it works is you have a group in the organization that is this Security Center of Excellence, and then they are in charge of looking at more forward-facing issues and building upon the existing uh, implementation, the existing operations that we have in a company. 
So they're looking at, once you have this baseline of security, how do we improve and how do we face the next round of threats that are gonna be coming our way? It's, it's building on that standard that we already have. And the way that Security Champions helps is because this information needs to be disseminated through, organiza through the organization. Because the Security uh, Center of Excellence team is not necessarily doing the day-to-day -day operations. Instead, they are the ones that are looking forward and then they need to share that back with the organization. Security Champions helps because those champions can be the ones to help share it amongst the teams. So this is the Center of Excellence. Finally, I'm gonna talk to you about a, new, uh, a newer way of doing this that is really a hybrid approach and it helps moving from uh, waterfall, moving from these slower development cycles where we have um, iterative cycle security as a gatekeeper into a method uh, where each developer needs to do everything. They need to do operations, QA, and security. So we're asking them to do this, now we need to show them how to do this. And so this is called continuous learning. So we have CI, CD, we now have CL. So it's easy to remember. It's essentially a framework to, uh, to enabling and empowering developers to be able to write code securely, to understand what that means, and to be able to continue to do that on their own. So first, there's four steps to this. Um, and the first step, it starts with threat modeling. I have to take a minute to take a look at this photo. Yes, it is a man in a ski mask with gloves holding a whiteboard. I didn't even care that there was uh, the watermarks on it. So threat modeling is typically a big, scary thing that organizations do. And if you do it, it's great, um, but it's a pain in the ass because it takes a lot of time. If you can do it, if you can take the time to be able to properly do a threat model and get a full understanding of all the risks inherent to your applications, that's amazing. You have a much better insight into your own application security than 99% of the other uh, organizations out there. But it takes a lot of time, and that's the, that's the pain of it. The way that you do threat modeling in continuous learning is different. There's two main ways that it's different. One, it's focused on one of the three layers of the CIA triads. So you have confidentiality, integrity, availability. We all know this, this is the basic things that we look for in security. So you take one of those, and then you work with uh, an individual developer or a team, and you go through their application that they're developing, targeting this particular aspect of security. So you're not trying to get a full understanding of all the application security issues, because there's gonna be a lot. Instead, you're focusing on one thing. The goal of this is not to get this full understanding. The goal is to get developers to start thinking about security. But not only that, get them interested in security. Because everyone here knows how fascinating it is. It's really, really cool. And if you can get that uh, spark of, insight, of, spark of um, interest into developers about security, then you've already won, frankly. Because we know that that spark turns into a fire very quickly as we all pursue the individual things that we love about security. So you get them interested and you get them thinking about security. Another important differentiator between this and the typical threat modeling is that this can be done on onboarding. Because it's small and quick enough, one of the main problems with uh, developers starting in any new organization is getting them up to speed with the applications they need to build. It takes a long time. That's the hardest part. But if you do this threat modeling exercise, you're introducing them to the application so they already have a better understanding of it, but you're integrating security into that introduction. So they're thinking about security already right from the start. So this is why it's important, and this is how you start with threat modeling. It's for getting them interested in getting them thinking about security. Next step is regular check-ins, and I will explain this image in a second. Regular check-ins is the point where security goes to developers. So we go to them, and we bring security to the top of their mind regularly. So this can be done through um, you know, through stand-up meetings, through uh, not necessarily pair programming, but through answering questions, but going to them and initiating that conversation. And there's a number of different times that you can do this. It all depends on how you're doing software development in your organization, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that you're bringing security to them. And you're not doing things for them, you're doing things with them. So we're not sitting down and writing their secure coding library, because that's not our job. We are training them to do that. We are helping them figure out what that means. So this is what regular check-ins is all about. And the reason why I have this picture is because Google actually does this themselves, where they have a team called the Testing Mercenaries, whose sole job is to go around the organization and help developers implement tests into their development um, lifecycle. And so I did a very poor job, and I didn't waste much time on this, but these are the mercenaries from Lost. Uh, and I, I photoshopped in a 
source code a little bit, and a whiteboard. Um, very poorly, but you know, it's the thought that counts, right? So hopefully you remember this. So after regular check-ins, we go, we're going to developers. The next step is having an open office. So this is, um, so we've, we've transitioned from introducing, getting them thinking about security, to going and keeping security on their mind regularly, to now, because of the highly dynamic nature of application security, every challenge they're gonna be facing can't be solved by one simple solution. As much as vendors will tell you that their solution will fix all your security problems, there's no one thing that will fix every security problem, especially when it comes to application security. Because like I said before, each problem is highly dynamic and unique to the organization and the application itself. So they're gonna have questions. They're gonna, have a, they're gonna be thinking about security, they're gonna have um, this introduction, their basic knowledge, but they're gonna have questions about how to actually implement what they're learning. And so at this point, this is where you invite them in to ask the questions that they need to ask. And at this point, because we've already gone through those first two steps, one thing I didn't mention about those steps is it helps build and establish a relationship between security and developers. Because as I said before, we need to tear down that gate and we need to help build a road with developers. We need to sit alongside them and work with them. So at this point, we have that relationship and they are coming to us to ask questions and we, we can answer questions in a more nuanced way. Some of the best, um, most beneficial uh, moments that I've had with organizations when I'm, when I'm working with them to improve security is when I sit down at lunch and I have a developer ask me about a problem they're having. Because then I can explain it to them in a more nuanced way and I can actually work with them in the context of the application they're building. Having that conversation is key. And so that's why we have open office. And if you think that this is difficult to scale, Capital One, one of the biggest organizations around, does this themselves, where they have subject matter experts that have open office hours where people can come in and ask questions about that subject. So we will do this very same thing with security. So as you can see, as we move, transition through these, different, these three different steps, developers, each individual developer is becoming more and more capable and independent when it comes to security and thinking about security more often. But the last step has to do with keeping it on their minds. Not forcing it on their minds, but keeping it on their minds. And so this is about maintaining interest. And yes, I will play you the GIF. And I will stop so that it doesn't distract you the entire time. <laughs> so maintaining interest, what does that mean? This is a way of keeping security uh, at the top of their minds because security, as we all know, is fascinating. It's really interesting. There's so many different things we can talk about. There's another talk right now going on Please don't leave right after I say this. <laughs> There's another talk going on right now about hacking medical devices. How cool is that? There's so many cool things that we can do in security. And so making sure developers know that is a way of keeping that interest going and keeping them thinking about it. So to do this, you can do things like doing speaker series, where you have someone from inside the organization, outside the organization, it doesn't matter, someone who is doing something interesting in security that they want to share. And then who knows, your developers might follow that rabbit hole down that you followed and come out with something that helps the organization. You can do capture the flag events. It's a little more um, intensive and, and difficult to set up, but you can do that. You can also do um, invite them to go to security conferences, like this one. Different ways to bring and keep security interesting for developers is really important because it's not forcing security on them anymore, it's making them interested so that they want to do it on their own. And this one is, is kind of maintains that continuous aspect of continuous learning because you're bringing this back to them so that they keep interested. And because you're doing this on onboarding, especially as you scale, security is gonna scale as you bring on more developers, easily. So these are the four different uh, components of continuous learning, and this will help bring you from the waterfall cycle where security is doing everything to the more independent way of doing software development where you're doing CI or CD, or even as you're transitioning through Agile. So that's what continuous learning looks like. Now, the last, the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about, the next and final component of building security into DevOps is automation. And this is key. However, without education, you will see that it doesn't work as well. But education augments this. But when we're talking about automation, because we have that really fast automated pipeline, you need to keep up with that in security as well. And I'll talk about what that means. But one thing that you need to remember when you're talking about automation, the key thing is we're trying to 
build an integrated pipeline with actionable results. Keywords being integrated and actionable. Remember that. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to have to roll up your sleeves and you're going to have to build some custom tooling. Because like I said, there's no one tool that's going to solve everything. There's no framework that's going to fix all your security problems. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. You're going to have to make something a little more customized. And especially at scale, this is kind of the solution because you're going to have so many unique edge cases. And so you're going to have to build this automation pipeline alongside this continuous delivery pipeline. So each stage on here can have tests, can have automation built into it. And you, as you build this automation pipeline, keep in mind what this look, looks like because you're going to be able to tie into this as well. So how do we do this? One of the ways we do this is we start differentiating between network security engineers and application security engineers. Instead of just having an, uh, you know, the typical security engineer that an organization has, differentiating between network security engineer and application security engineer is important because app tech engineers come from a development background, usually. Or they're passionate about, about development. They like that aspect of security and use that. So speaking for myself, I, I love building things. I love writing software. If I can integrate that into security as well, then I have the best of both worlds. And because you're going to be building out this custom tooling, these are the people that are going to help you do it, your application security engineers. One thing you're going to have to remember is starting small. You're going to have to start small because you can't build it all in one day, one year, even a month. It doesn't matter. No amount of time. It will almost never be done. But you're going to have to start small, and you'll get there. Just remember this. <laughs> you will get there. As frustrating as it might be, the process, you're going to get there, and eventually, you're going to build this. Google themselves, and I, I will call back to Google because they're an example of a company that's able to do this at scale. They have over 120,000 individual test cases. It's a big number. But they didn't do this in a day, a year. It took them many, many years, and they have over 100 different test engineers that help build these test cases. So you'll get there, but it just takes time. Start small. When you're building these tools into this pipeline, you're going to have to make modular tools. This is not just a good best practice for development in general. It's good for building these tools that are going to integrate security into your, into your pipeline. Because remember, one of the key concepts is integrating your tools in, into your existing workflow. And this has a side benefit of having your AppSec engineers or your developers that are working on this. Their background may be in Python. It may be in C. It may be in Java. It doesn't really matter where they're coming from. If you use something like, let's say, Docker, they can build on whatever they want, whatever system they're familiar with, but as long as you have a standard input output, or inputs and outputs and documentation, don't forget documentation, then you're going to be able to integrate them all together. They're going to be able to plug into each other really, really easily. This is a key concept to remember as well, because one of the hardest parts when you're building this security pipeline is where to start. What test cases are you going to write first? <laughs> key principle that you're going to need to remember is don't repeat the same mistakes twice. Don't ever repeat them. If you can avoid it, do that. The saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So if you're having some repeated security vulnerabilities, write a test to catch it so that it gets, it, it gets stopped before it gets pushed into production. This is one of the key ways to start integrating and catching and writing these tests is to look for things that have already come up before. Not only that, um, this will help you from a more business standpoint, this will help you get buy-in because you're going to be showing immediate results. If you can stop that same thing that comes up on a pen test year after year after year, which we've all seen, if you can stop that, then that's a huge win. And that's an easy way to get support from people way up on high in the organization that you need to keep doing this. Because like I said, it's going to take time. Another key concept is unit tests. This is something that is built into every single developer's workflow, or should be built into most people's workflow, every modern software, uh, every modern uh, programming language has some kind of unit testing framework for it. And likely your developers are already writing unit tests. I hope they are. If they're already writing unit tests, then why not integrate security into finding those same mistakes? Integrate these security tests into the framework they're already using. So I don't mean writing tests to anticipate future security issues, because that's difficult and often won't work out and will just slow things down. Remember, we have to keep this actionable. If we write unit tests about things that we've already seen in that application, 
then it won't happen again. And developers already know how to write unit tests, and so it's integrated into their existing workflow. Really, really important. One other thing to remember when we're talking about unit tests is that when crunch time comes, which it will, and developers are pushed to start pushing out features and they don't have time, one of the first things to go is unit tests. So this is where the importance of measuring test coverage comes into play. So there's many tools out there to do it, but you can ensure that you have a certain level of test coverage across all of your applications. And then, for example, one way to action that would be to fail to build if there's less than 80% test coverage. 80% is a good benchmark to look at. Realistically, 100% is not really useful. There's a point of diminishing returns. 80 is about that point. So integrate unit tests in with security as well. I haven't forgotten about the systems that they're running on. I haven't forgotten about the infrastructure side of things. A key principle in DevOps is infrastructure as code. And what that means is you're storing the configurations for your different systems that are running in production the same way developers are store storing their source code. So they have the configuration saved in a file, and that file is being checked into something like Git for easy rollback, for tracking. It makes things a lot easier. And you don't have to worry about going into an individual system in production trying to tweak that. Instead, you have the configuration to fall back on. Using tools like Ansible, Chef, Salt, Puppet, there's a bunch of them out there. Using these tools to do infrastructure as code makes building the security pipeline way easier because then you can target your infrastructure as well as your applications. So it not only helps improve your um, uh, releases into production, it will also help improve your testing of those configurations as well. Pen tests are important. They're still important. They don't stop being important because they help you catch and find those deeper, more technical challenging issues. Those things that you may not have spotted through a unit test. They're going to keep coming up. I'm going to give you a, a little dirty secret about security automation. You're never going to catch everything. This is where pen tests come in. But where they help you when it comes to security automation, use the results from the pen tests as sources for what you're going to test for in your automated pipeline. So that, like I said, we don't have the same pen tests being done year after year and finding the same results year after year because that happens. Use those pen tests and feed it into that automation pipeline. It's one of the best ways to make use of, of the pen test so it doesn't just become a PDF that sits in your, you know, on your a drive somewhere for eternity. If you already have these existing tools in your environment, these big scanners that try to catch everything, it's okay to have them in your environment, but there's going to be some things that you need to do. Before I get into what you need to do with these tools, you can make use of this when you're building out this pipeline as, as compensating measures. So you're not going to cover everything up, up front. The hardest part is finding the things to test for, but until you have bigger and more test coverage, use these to try to fill in those gaps. It's fine to do that. You probably already have them. And, and just to check how many people are paying attention, this doesn't exist, so don't bother Googling it. I just made it up. <laughs> it's a pretty good logo, though. So I mean, if you see Cloud Champion LLC coming out next week, you know, you know where to look. First thing you're going to do is a good practice in general when you're using these tools is you're going to have to tune it. Because remember, one of the two key aspects, two key things to keep in mind when you're talking about automation is that the results need to be actionable. If you have 2,000 results from a Fortify scan, how many developers are actually going to go through that and fix each individual issue? I mean, you're going to have to really push them to do that or it's not going to happen at all. Or that Fortify scan will magically disappear. So make sure you're tuning your tools so that you have enough findings that you're certain of. We don't want false positives because it's just a waste of time. Be sure of those findings and make it so that it's a manageable amount that developers can actually do something with. So they don't have to spend half their time or more pruning out false positives or figuring out which ones are actually mitigated by something else. So tune the tools to make it easier to actually action those results. And finally, you want to also make sure that these tools have an API. An API helps because it allows you to plug in this tool that you're using into your pipeline that you're building. Remember how I said making those tools modular is important? This also makes your tools modular in a way because it has a standard way of getting input and output into a tool. You don't have to worry about you know, the inter intricacies of that tool. This makes it easy to interact and integrate that tool with your existing pipeline or the pipeline you're building. So if your tool doesn't have an API, reach out to your vendor, try to get them to put it in. I don't know what to tell you. 
APIs really help. So finally, after all of this, all of these things that I, I'm telling you you need to do to make sure you have security in DevOps, it's hard. There's a lot involved in it, but you can do it. The hardest part is knowing where to start. So I'm going to give you um, a few key things that you can use to start building this, and it'll help you get that momentum going. First off, SD Elements, full disclosure, that's built by this, these guys that I work for. And it basically allows you to plug in what kind of application you're building, and then it'll tell you exactly what you need to know to write secure code for that language, for that framework, whatever you're building. It's used in the requirement stage, so if we're talking about the old school SDLC, where you have requirements, design, all of that, that's gone in continuous delivery. Use this to help understand what test case you need to build. So that's the hardest part, is understanding what to build first. This will tell you. Not just the OS top 10, there's a cheat sheet that actually gives you some implementation specifics to the language you're building in. That's pretty helpful. It's a little older, but it's some common software security issues that you might see. And one of the key sources of input for building this pipeline is old findings and mistakes, whether that's through pen tests, vulnerability scans, um, whether that's just through having an incident in production, right? Look, go through all your old uh, uh, incident response tickets and see what you had to respond to. Those are some of the key sources that are tailored to your existing environment to try to find first. There's some other tools, and I'm going to point out some specific tools um, because of the, uh, mainly because of the uh, organizations that built them to show that it's possible to do this at the scale that they're operating at and that they are doing it. So here's a few open source tools that have been developed um, by these companies to do automation, to do efficient testing that they're using today. So Netflix has a couple. They're really well known for this. Um, Simeon Army includes the well-known uh, Chaos Monkey tool. Etsy is really good at doing this as well. Um, Yelp has a tool. I'm not sure about how much into continuous delivery they're doing, but they've released tools like this that help. And Breakman, this one's actually pretty interesting. This is a, a security scanner, a static analysis tool for Ruby on Rails. Twitter actually went out, because they used it and they found it so effective, they hired the guy that wrote it, and they're still developing it. So these are some tools that you can use to A, see how it's being done by these big companies. It can be done at scale and B, to start plugging into your own environment. They're open source, you can modify it if you want, and you can also see how it's being done. So these are some other tools to use. Now I'm gonna talk about AWS specifically right now because most organizations, most people in this room are likely using AWS in their organization. And there's a number of tools because they have like hundreds of tools out there and most of them, most people aren't even aware of and they're gonna probably release a whole bunch more at reInvent again this year. But until then, these, these are things that you may not already know about that exist in AWS that you can make use of to help you build this security pipeline. First is AWS Code Pipeline. So AWS Code Pipeline is essentially a continuous delivery pipeline builder on AWS. It has a GUI if you want. It also has it, you can do it from the code level. But it allows you to build through these different continuous delivery steps natively in AWS. This is like AWS Inspector is kind of like a Nessus Lite. It's not quite as good, it's not as full featured, but it's just started. So it's very brand new, specific to AWS environments. So it's a, it's a vulnerability scanner built in AWS. Remember how I mentioned uh, infrastructure as code? This is what it looks like in AWS. It's cloud formation. So if you're building based on these templates, it'll, you can integrate these into your testing pipeline to actually um, scan your, your configurations as well as your code. AWS config, uh, you define a configuration for an environment, what it should look like. If it falls outside of that configuration, it will alert you. And CloudWatch events. Um, so CloudWatch and CloudTrail are really useful because they tell you what's going on in your environment. But that may not be quick enough for you. If you need, and this is very likely that you're gonna wanna do this, if you wanna action them right away, if you wanna do something about those events immediately, Lambda allows you to plug into those CloudWatch events and do something and action those events instantaneously. So if you're not using any of those, it's worth looking into because it will help you integrate security much more efficiently into your existing environment. And so finally, I wanna leave you with this message. Combining education and automation, you get remediation. Now there's one last key point that I've kind of saved for last. Using DevOps and using a continuous delivery model 
is not only effective for pushing out features, but one thing that we fail to realize often is that by building this pipeline, we're not only building a pipeline to efficiently push out code to make, you know, to make our, our product better, it also allows us to push out security fixes faster than ever before. Think about it. You have a pipeline in place to push code into production immediately. That doesn't have to be something that we are scared of in security. It's something that we need to embrace because that can help us out immensely. And that's something that not a lot of people realize as they're fighting against and railing against developers doing all these things on their own in the speed of DevOps. So if you remember this and you embrace what I've talked about today, you'll find that your security operations will become faster, better, and you can respond to incidents faster than ever before. So here's some key points for you to take a picture of if you want, take home with you. Um, but that's everything I have to say today. If you have any questions, feel free to, to ask me anytime. Thank you very much. Before I go, I think I still have like four minutes. Uh, if you guys have any questions you want to ask in front of the group, um, feel free to ask and I can answer it right now. Yes. So I know that those people that are scared to get into tool groups, uh, we have a client that uh, wants to integrate uh, static analysis tools into their pipeline, but it just takes too long for the tool to run before it gets put to production. Mm. Uh, my response was, that's fine. It's okay. Let's, let's let the tool run and apply any vulnerability. Right. Sure. Um, so the question was, for those that didn't hear it, is that um, he's a client, it's a client, right? Yeah. Client that wants to integrate um, static analysis into their environment, but they're worried that it takes too long to actually do these scans before being pushed out to production. Yes, it, it, it does. It takes a while, <laughs> um, as we've seen from the thousands of results from most static analysis tools. Where we can fix that is by encouraging them to build these individual tests to start finding these things in a modular way. So by making these little modules, you can call the ones that you need if you really want, specific to that application, and those will be done much quicker because it's small little chunks instead of you know, something that's running everything at once. Um, another way to look at it is to split up the tests into the different, um, different stages of the pipeline. So you'll have different tests running on commit, different tests running on build, different tests running on push to production. So for example, you might want to look at, when you're looking at commit, um, do a simple linting for, you know, look, look if SQL's queries are being concatenated with user input, or there's any concatenation in a SQL query. Simple things like that will catch things quickly right away, so you don't have to worry about covering those simple things later on. So if you integrate smaller tests into the different stages of continuous delivery, then it happens much more quickly and much more efficiently. It takes time to build that, so it's gonna take a bit to get there. Um, but if you encourage that as the goal of what you want to move to, it will solve both security and developers' issues because you're getting the security coverage and you're doing it quickly. Does that answer your question? I guess to clarify, my question is, as security people, should that be our stance that we should be trying to help them go faster? Or should we at some point say, well, you know what, there is a risk of a critical vulnerability in your production, and that is high enough to justify a small little test? So there's, this is where, this is something that I didn't really talk about, and this is, um, this is kind of the reality of continuous delivery, is that if you have a very low risk tolerant organization, um, say financial institutions, most big public facing parts of government, um, continuous delivery probably won't work. And they shouldn't necessarily be pushing towards that. As much as I say it's like the gold standard of, of development, that's for businesses that need to compete a lot in the marketplace. If they don't have to worry about that and they're very low risk tolerant, then yes, you can push faster, um, but it gets to a certain point where there is that trade-off of being able to make mistakes in production versus not. Um, so I think that to a certain point we should be okay with pushing them to work fast, to, to go faster. If that's where they want to go and they're okay with that, then we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to go along with them and move fast as security. Um, but if they have that really low risk tolerance, then it may not be that continuous delivery is right for them. Is that, is there, is that answer? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Is there any other questions? Um, in the minus 30 seconds I have. You know what, if you have any other questions, please feel free to approach me outside of the, you know, the conference or reach out to me anytime. This is my contact info and I'm happy to talk. Thanks guys.
It's not to. Yeah, no problem.